And truly, scientific discourse is getting a shot in the arm, no pun intended, and we're starting to see much more candid discussions of what's gone on over the last three years. Today, I want to speak briefly about all-cause mortality, infection fatality rate, or IFR, versus CFR, which is case fatality rate, and immunity, both natural and herd. Over the last six weeks, I've been gathering articles together, and I think we're prepared to talk about several things. First and foremost, uh, nothing, nothing I say here should be construed as medical advice uh, to any individual. This is my opinion and simply the exercise on my part of my First Amendment rights, but I am not intending to speak for any group, party, or to any patient and suggest medical advice. So having said that, let me just start with, sometimes in order to understand what's happened, we have to let the science breathe, but then we have to, have to almost go back in order to go forward. So let's go back to an article in the Los Angeles Times, April 27th, 2009. So this would have been more than a decade before the COVID pandemic. The Los Angeles Times had an article written by Sherry Rowan, R-O-A-N, Sherry, S-H-A-R-I, and it was called The Swine Flu Debacle of 1976 is Recalled. So now, about 14 years ago, this is what was said. Warren Ward, 48, was in high school when the swine flu threat of 1976 swept the U.S. The government want everyone to get vaccinated, Ward said. But the epidemic never really broke out. It was a threat that never materialized. What did materialize were cases of a rare side effect thought to be linked to the shot. The unexpected development cut short the vaccination effort, an unprecedented national campaign after 10 weeks. The episode triggered an enduring public backlash against flu vaccination. Later in the article, Dr. Richard Wenzel, chairman of internal medicine at Virginia Commonwealth University, who diagnosed some of the early cases in, in 1976, had this to say. So this is in 2009. He's speaking about what happened in 1976, more than a quarter of a century earlier. He said, the swine flu, let me start again. He said, I think we're going to have to be cautious. Hopefully there will be a lot of good, honest public health discussion about what happened in 1976. This article that I'm referring to in the Los Angeles Times basically wanted to examine that the lessons that could come from the swine flu vaccination program and epidemic of 1976. But what it said in here is, in order to do things better, officials must keep the public informed, they must admit what they know and don't know. They must have a plan ready should the health threat become dangerous. That's what the Los Angeles Times article says. So let's jump into all-cause mortality. All-cause mortality is one of those statistics that really is easy to measure because it can't really be massaged. We're talking about dead people. We're talking about people who died, and there's no question they died. We're not talking about how they were diagnosed or what they were diagnosed with. We're not talking about, uh, did someone uh, fudge the numbers? Did someone not use an appropriate ICD-10 code as they parlayed data from a state Department of Health into a national federal registrar for disease? We're talking about just dead people. How many? Well, we know that in America, we have about uh, 3 million people die every year and that's out of 325 million Americans. So we have about one out of 100 people die every year. So we're talking about that all-cause mortality. It doesn't matter what the cause was. They're dead. So 3 million every year. Recent data analysis by Bobby Bounds said this in regards to Minnesota death certificates for children between 0 and 14 years of age. This is kids between 0 and 14 years of age. All-cause mortality. In 2019, all-cause mortality for this group of people was 473. 473, just about 500. In 2020, the first year of the pandemic, it dropped to 434. It dropped. In the midst of the worst pandemic in my lifetime, the number of kids dying of all-cause mortality dropped from 
473 to 434. What happened the next year? It was still lower in 2021 than it was in 2019. It was 459. And then in 2022, it went back up to its 2019 level and exceeded it by nine. There were 482 deaths. So when you look at all-cause mortality, and you look at 2020 and 2021, and you say, well, was the all-cause mortality for kids between 0 and 14 justification for locking kids out of school, increasing their risk of being physically abused or sexually abused without any reporting pathways in place because they'd been disrupted by locking kids out of school? You would have to say, this is very, very telling information that we hurt the kids and the all-cause mortality was there. The data was there. We could have responded quicker. Let's go next to IFR versus CFR. You hear a lot about this. There were epidemiologists during the pandemic that didn't seem to make a distinction between infectious fatality rate, IFR, or case fatality rate, CFR. The case fatality rate deals with the number of people, the percentage of people who die from a documented case of COVID. If you go to the World Health Organization page, I just did that earlier this morning, and look at IFR, CFR for COVID-19, the World Health Organization will acknowledge that case fatality rates, because they're limited and they're not representative of the population, literally varied anywhere from 0.1% estimate all the way to 25%. 25% would be one out of four people that had COVID, a case confirmed, died. It was all over the map. But infectious fatality rate recognizes that for every person that's actually identified as having COVID, had a positive test, had the symptoms, was seen, was documented to have COVID, for every case with infectious fatality rate, frequently there'll be 10 more that never got officially diagnosed. So recent study came out showing that in regards to the IFR, it has the United States pegged at about 0.2, a little less, 0.18. It has us in the same area as Germany, Ireland, England. We didn't do nearly as well as countries like Denmark, Finland. They had a much lower IFR. Typical influenza epidemic outbreak for America is usually about 0.1%, maybe 0.2 in a robust. And that's where COVID ended up. So in terms of the IFR, that's probably more important, but it's also an extrapolation of data. But it falls in that realm of some of the other severe influenza outbreaks that we might have. Then let's talk about immunity. There's a book written by Gabriel Bauer called Blind Sight is 2020. And in this, it makes a comment. The dominant narrative positioned the COVID virus as the enemy in a planetary war, an enemy we must fight to the bitter end, costs be damned. But as it became clear that the war was unwinnable, a second story began gaining momentum. This story cast COVID as a guest that, while not exactly welcome, was here to stay. So we needed to find a way to coexist with it without destroying our social fabric. Interesting. So this book by Gabriel Bauer goes on to say, some experts wanted to turn the world into an infection control zone, but they failed. She says, my book celebrates the triumph of the messy human spirit over the institutional forces of regimentation and coercion. That's a book called Blindsight is 2020 by Gabriel Bauer. Let's use that as a springboard for what I have to say about natural immunity. June 15th, 2023, in the conversation, Matt Hitchings, an assistant professor of biostatistics at the University of Florida, and Derek Cummings, a professor of biology at the University of Florida, wrote an article, and it was entitled, 96.4% of Americans had COVID-19 antibodies in their blood by fall of 2022. So the pandemic started in 
February, March of 2020, in the fall of 2022, two and a half years later, 96.4% of Americans had antibodies. We gain this information by doing zero surveys and extrapolating data. What does that mean? If I go and measure your blood for antibodies, either to the spike protein or the nucleocapsid uh, protein in uh, your blood, these antibody tests are very accurate. A small margin of error, but far more accurate than the PCR tests that we utilized to diagnose COVID-19, either in asymptomatic people or people with symptoms or people just coming into the emergency room in the hospital. But the bottom line is when we do a zero survey, zero, S-E-R-O, it means we're using the serum and we're checking the antibodies. In. Well, on that basis, according to the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report of 2023, which is put out by the CDC, they said this, just about everyone in the U.S. had antibodies to SARS-CoV-19, the virus that causes COVID-19, by September of 2022. Half of the people had hybrid immunity based on having both been infected and vaccinated, 47.7%. But they said that 26.1% had it because of the vaccine only, and 22.6% had it because they got infected only. So just to round it off, they're saying about a quarter of the population had the disease and that's how they're immune. Another quarter got vaccinated and that's how they're immune. And half got infected and got vaccinated. But what this article really points out is that people are now, now acknowledging that natural immunity isn't some political hot potato that can be bantered about and thrown under the bus or thrown out the window, which is exactly what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic. People literally were questioning whether or not natural immunity is a real microbiologic principle, and it is. It has to be. Here's another article to speak to that issue. This article was um, about the Cleveland Clinic. It was written by uh, Nabin Shrestha, Patrick Burke, Amy Nowaki, and Stephen Gordon. Released June 9th, 2023, it's a preprint, so it hasn't been peer approved. The title of it was Risk of Coronavirus Disease 2019 Among Those Up to Date and Not Up to Date on COVID-19 Vaccination. So this is people that were up to date on their vaccines for COVID and people that weren't. And here was a summary. Among 48,000 working age Cleveland Clinic employees, those not up to date on COVID vaccine had a lower risk of COVID-19 than those up to date. What does that say? That means that natural immunity is real. There was a wrap up before Congress on May 12th, 2023 press release. And in it, it was entitled, hearing wrap up, coronaviruses confer robust natural immunity government officials should have considered in policy decisions. The Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic held a hearing titled Investigating Pandemic Immunity, Acquired, Therapeutic, or Both. And that's just what I referred to in the previous data from the Morbidity and Mortality Report. They wanted to examine the role COVID-19 vaccines and naturally acquired immunity played in public health discussions. Here's what Dr. Marty McCary said. He said, Nothing speaks more to the intellectual dishonesty of public health officials and their complete dismissal of the data on natural immunity, making the U.S. an international outlier in this academic dishonesty. Lives were lost because they were ignored, and thousands of Americans died because public health officials ignored natural immunity. This was at a congressional hearing. I just gave you data on a Cleveland Clinic survey of their employees. Bottom line is natural immunity is an established fact. We've used it immensely for respiratory virus diseases. We've used it with measles. If you're born before 1957, you don't have to have a blood test to prove that you have an antibody. We know that people got measles virtually across the board prior to 1957. They developed natural immunity. They did not have a vaccine. They didn't receive a vaccine. And we don't even check antibodies. So this was something that was horrific. When we had scientists and doctors denying the reality of natural immunity, I will never forget the 
contradictory statements made by Tony Fauci regarding herd immunity. When initially there was some idea that we needed to get 50% of the population immune and then maybe we would reach herd immunity where there wouldn't be an active pool of people who could get the disease and spread it. And then he went to 60 or 65 and 70 and he sounded like an auctioneer. And finally, he was challenged on this. And they said, why did you keep moving that number? Why didn't you just say what you ended with at the beginning? And his comment was something to the effect, I didn't know if people could handle it. Herd immunity is a real thing. If you have a population that's got a disease running through it and you're able to get herd immunity, everybody in the herd, whether you're talking cows, pigs, or humans, if 98% have got it, had the disease, and now have antibodies to it, you only have a very small pool of people that can harbor that disease and serve as a vector. Only 2% in that situation. Bottom line is, we're starting to see some sanity in the conversations we're having. All cause mortality. Nobody can play with those numbers. Infection fatality rate. It's going to land somewhere in that 0.1 to 0.5%, and it's going to be in the ballpark of what we've done before. And natural immunity is a real thing. And herd immunity is a real tool for veterinarians and for humans alike. We need to do more of this as we go forward. I know that we're all going to forget the horror and the, the barbaric intrusion into our individual liberties that government took advantage of. But we cannot forget that so much of the research that had been done in the 20, 30, 40, 50 years prior to this pandemic, we had good solid evidence that we could have used to make better decisions. If you want some reading tonight before you go to bed, read the Great Barrington Declaration once again. See the laser targeted focus on helping protect those people who are most vulnerable. That made sense. The idea that natural immunity would be the thing that comes to save us. And in this situation, the Omicron virus variant ended up being not nearly so virulent. But the combination of Omicron being more mild and 96% plus having antibodies in the population through zero surveys, that's really gotten us to where we're at today. So let's keep talking. Let's talk about these, these real principles. And let's remember all-cause mortality, People are going to have a hard time playing, playing games with those numbers. IFR, we're in that ballpark, and the CFR data went anywhere from 0.1% to 25%. It was truly a scattergram. And natural immunity, don't ever doubt its reality. It's the way our God-given immune systems do indeed fight off infections and help us stay alive. Have a great weekend.